Eight years ago, I wrote a book. It was called The Breakthrough, Politics and Race in the Age of Obama. It came out on Inauguration Day, but it really had only a passing uh, interest in what, it only passingly had anything to do with Barack Obama because what I thought was interesting was in the course of my entire career covering politics um, at four different newspapers and then for NBC News and then for PBS, was that I had been exposed to a lot of changes in the world and changes in politics and changes in politicians. And because of who my parents were, immigrants to this country, my father was a civil rights activist, I got to be very engaged in current affairs and what was happening around the world. So what I saw in the years that as I was covering politics and learning to cover politics was that people kept walking through the doors that other people had opened. I thought to myself, hey, look who's out here running for office now, and how interesting is it to me that, in fact, they had been babies when Martin Luther King was marching, but that by the time they became adults, they had, been, they had worked themselves up to the point where they thought they could benefit from some of the things that he had uh, fought for, for instance. So I chose to focus on four black politicians, Barack Obama, who at the time was a senator from Illinois, uh, Cory Booker, who at the time was mayor of Newark, New Jersey, and is now uh, a senator from New Jersey. Since I wrote the book, I believe I had a lot to do with it, you know, whatever. <laughs> Deval Patrick, who at the time was governor of Massachusetts. Arthur Davis, who at the time was running for governor of Alabama as an African-American. That was kind of a stunning thing, and I thought it was worth watching. And then for the paperback version, you're fabulous, thank you. That's Matt. Say hi. Hi. Mm -hmm. And then the paperback version was all about, I included and focused on Kamala Harris, who at the time was the attorney general for the state of California and now is heavily favored to become the next senator from the state of California. So I watched them, I talked to them, I followed the kinds of things. And, it, and eight years later, it's really fun to watch what happened to them. Of course, Barack Obama got elected. A lot of people thought at the time, oh, Gwen Eiffel's writing a book about Barack Obama. I think I just lucked into that. I didn't. I was probably the last person who thought that America was ready for that. Um, Cory Booker is now in the Senate, of course. Artur Davis <laughs> not only got killed running for governor of Alabama as an African American, he didn't even win his home precinct in Montgomery, I think. So he was, he was bitter. He re retreated not only from Alabama politics, but from the Democratic Party, moved to Virginia, became a Republican, ran again for something else, got beat again, and hasn't been heard from since. So it doesn't always work to break through. Uh, Deval Patrick's term as governor of Massachusetts ran out. His name comes up for various things, but I think right now he's enjoying making money in the private sector. And of course, as we mentioned, Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris is doing very well in California. So what happens when people break through, whether it's African-Americans or Hispanics or women or anybody who's never been at the table before? I discovered looking at what's happened in these several years, a couple things happen. One is there is an immediate assault. There's a pushback from the people who, always, who held the baton before. No one likes to give up power that much. And the one thing these folks had in common is they always ignored the people who told them no. Every time after time when I talk to people, who are, whether they're mayors or county councilors or people who want to be president, they all told me anecdotes about how the first time they wanted to run for a big office, someone said to them, no, you can't do it. It's not your turn yet. And they would say, well, we're going to make it our turn and snatch the baton from the older folks. That happened time and time again. And, and that's so what happens when that occurs is you come under immediate assault. When Shirley Chisholm ran for president in 1972, African-American congresswoman from Brooklyn, she was immediately under assault even for members of her own party and members of her own race because they were like, who are you? What are you doing? It's not your turn. Uh, black men in particular, black elected officials were very harsh about her uh, assuming that she could step into a role that they still felt that they owned. Um, Barack Obama famously, as he became, after he became president, became, came under a sustained assault for things like whether he was born here. To this day, there's a Republican nominee who won't just say, yes, I know, he was born here, even though his running mate did, which is interesting. Um, but that kind of thing happened. Whenever there were explosions in our society, whether it was the historian Henry Louis Gates Jr. being arrested at his doorstep, and then there, there was a famous beer summit at the White House where the president tried to smooth it all over, the president took the hit for that. When Trayvon Martin was killed and the president said, I would have a son that looked for, like Trayvon Martin, which seemed like a reasonable thing to say to me because he could have, uh, people said, ah, he's, ra he ma he's making this racial, even though it seemed like it was racial before. When Black Lives Matter's m movement popped up uh, and the president commented on that, 
he was always, whenever he talked about race, he always became a particular, even though he was a president who didn't like to talk about race that much, he always became under assault. So the president was always at the center of these debates, and that was probably as it would always be. So I look at these, I look at these at a time now when President Obama is about to leave the stage, and, the, and, and so many others are beginning to follow in his footsteps. So I walked, watched to see what makes for a breakthrough, whether it's a, a female breakthrough, a male breakthrough, whatever it is. You have to walk through doors that others opened. You have to never say, accept no or wait, as Martin Luther King said in his famous letter from the Birmingham jail. And you have to brace for the attacks to come. Now, when I traveled talking about this book quickly, in almost every case, people ask me about gender. Who are the women who are going to break through? And of course, we now are witnessing it. Hillary Clinton, almost, uh, what is she, six, almost six, 70 years old, 65 years old. She is at not exactly the breakthrough in terms of youth, <laughs> but she is the breakthrough in 2016 as the first woman to ever win the nomination of her party. Um, the doors were open. She fits the breakthrough uh, theory in lots of ways. Doors were open for her, in her case, by suffragettes, by women like Shirley Chisholm, um, who obviously ran for president and never had a chance. Uh, people like Pat Schroeder, who was the senator from Colorado, who also ran for president, probably de never had a chance. But pe also people like Sojourner Truth, who said, you know, are I not a woman, and tried to make the case among in the early women's movement that black women had a role. And people like Elizabeth Dole, who, who, who stepped onto the stage at a Republican convention at, that I attended and completely captivated the crowd, but did not win the nomination. And doors were opened for her, obviously, by her husband, Bill Clinton. And that's for better and for worse, which is to say, people think they know her pretty well, people think they know him pretty well, and they don't always like what they see. So we have a very interesting and complicated race. The tax, which is one of the other qualif qualifications for a breakthrough candidate, have also come constantly with her. A lot of it's been self-inflicted wounds, it has to be said. But the fact is, even if she were to be elected, none of this is going to stop. We're still going to keep having these debates. When she was also told to wait, and that was 2008, when she ran against Barack Obama and lost, that was basically part of the breakthrough movement, where she was told no, and she was told wait. And so now she thinks that this is her term, to, after having been a, a good Girl Scout, gone back, become Secretary of State, which isn't exactly a, a bad thing to do, and now is coming back, and she thinks it's her term. Which brings us to 2016. The most improbable campaign I have ever covered. I would have never seen this coming, and if anybody tells you they did, they are lying to you. I am telling you that now. Uh, there are so many things to talk about which make this an unusual race. One of them is the old school versus the new school. We have the old school politician who, no question, is Hillary Clinton. She's the one who's running the ads. She's the one who's giving the speeches and putting detailed policy papers on her website and all the things that you're supposed to do. But the real truth is she is an old-fashioned candidate at a time when all of a sudden we've turned to something else against a decidedly new-fashioned candidate, a 70-year-old millionaire, maybe billionaire, we're not sure how much he's worth because he won't release his tax <laughs> statements, but from New York, who um, continues to baffle, continues to baffle. You may have heard overnight that um, the independent candidate, Gary Johnson, was asked about a question about Syria, and it, the question was, you know, what would you do about Aleppo? And his response was, what is Aleppo? Well, the problem with that, of course, is he's running for president. The other problem with that, but the, here's the thing, it, when he was called on it, his response was, I guess I have to make myself smarter on the issues. That's true, but it's also refreshing that when you're caught in something you don't know about, you actually say it. Um, that's something the Republican nominee is not really good at. Last night he was asked about a tweet that he put out in 2003 or four years ago about women in the military and sexual assault in the military. And his response in that tweet was, what would you expect if you're going to put men and women together? He was asked about this. His, it would have been easy for him to say, that was then, this is now. I realized that was a little too flip. Instead, he said, I stand by that tweet. He stands by whatever he says, whether it's been proved uh, wrong, inaccurate, and not factual. I'm looking for lots of uh, metaphors here. So he has ma managed to make this an improbable race because in spite of her playing by all the rules, spending the money, raising the money, doing the things you're supposed to do, she has, he has a ma managed still to be within striking distance now. And both of them have managed to get mild-mannered white male running mates to be their, their attack dogs. Uh, the biggest surprises for me is that Utah is a toss-up. Utah, a very Republican state, obviously Mitt Romney was the nominee four years ago and got like 99, actually more like 85% of the vote. 
But the fact that a Republican state like that is up in the air is very interesting to me. The fact that South Carolina, another Republican state, is even possible for the Democrats is surprising to me. I am surprised that both candidates are so wildly unpopular. It's not just that one of them is unpopular, it's that they both really, really, really are disliked. And that seems to be driving this close election as much as facts. And that the president, in the end, for all of everything that's gone on for the past eight years, is relatively popular. He's Compared to the other two running for president, he's wildly popular. So part of this is driven, of course, by the media debate, which is where I come in, in part. Uh, we have constant navel-gazing debates in the news media about how does one cover a race like this, something that is so unexpected, something that is so out of the blue that none of us have any experience covering. This is my eighth presidential election. I sh I'm shocked to hear myself say it, but that's how many I've covered, and I've never seen anything like this. So I watch it, and I think to myself, what is different about this election? One of them is this notion of equivalency. We debated among ourselves, which is how do you decide whether to balance things out e equally. If one candidate says something crazy and the other person says something a little crazy but not really crazy, do you cover them as if they both made the fa same issue, the same gaffe? Um, I think not, but it's harder than it looks like to do. It's very, I, I moderated two debates in 2004 and 2008, vice presidential debates, and I'm here to tell you it's not easy to get them to stick to what they're supposed to say within time limits and to, and to challenge them on those issues and to try to find a way to make it issue. We can talk about more of that some more in the Q&A, but that is part of our debate. Fact-checking seems to be very difficult for us. Uh, we can say that a guy lied. We can say that a woman uh, expanded on the truth, uh, but we can't. But it doesn't seem to matter. It doesn't change voters' minds. They seem to be driven not so much by the facts as by the sensation of what they like. At the Republican convention this year, uh, everybody seemed pretty blasé until you started screaming, lock her up. And that's the first time we got some excitement. There was more ex anti-Hillary excitement at this debate, at this convention, than there was pro-Trump uh, excitement, which tells me that that's what's driving this election, that's what's making it so close, the fact that Hillary Clinton is disliked as much as that they like, uh, they like or love um, Donald Trump. And Donald Trump is a reality candidate in a reality time, and so it's really very interesting to watch them, watch us try to do this at a time when technology is driving so much of our debate. Um, now, technology, I think, is a good thing in general. I think I find out a lot, things, a lot of things faster. I'm a little bit of a Twitter addict, Gwen Eiffel at, at Gwen Eiffel, you can just say. And, and as a result, I find out a lot of things faster. Um, but you have to be careful with your technology. You have to find a way to curate it so that it makes sure you're hearing every side of the issue, that you're putting it in some sort of context, that you're not just using it to go back into the bubble of people who only agree with you. At least that's my role. I, I believe that if we only are talking to people who agree with us, we are failing in some way to understand our world and our country. So how do we use it to shape rather than damage what it is that we're trying to do as citizens. I think there's a way to do it, but it, mean, it means that we have to be, uh, we have to be curators of our own lives. We have to make sure that everything we're finding out isn't just what happened around the corner, what happened with only our friends, what happened with only the politicians or the radio show hosts we like to listen to. Otherwise, we stay stuck in the bubble, and that's where we end up November 8th. Um, and then finally, and I'll stop and talk to you a little bit more for your questions. Will journalism as we know it survive? As long as I have been in journalism, people have always said it's about to die. That, you know, that one thing or the other is going to take it out. I was a newspaper journalist, and they said newspapers will die. And uh, they're not doing so well, but they are reincarnated in a different way. You can still read print content, just as most of you probably do, online or on a screen. Um, I still like to hold a newspaper, but that's the old-fashioned part of me because that was my very first job, and I still have some great nostalgia about that. I also think there's information I get from a newspaper I hold that I miss online when I'm only clicking on the things I'm interested in. But that's a different form of journalism. I think people said television was going to die. Television is not only not dying, it's expanded in remarkable ways that I haven't seen since I was in there. We have a million different ways of getting your information, and we're as responsible as ever for finding out what that is and how to do it. Journalism is opposed to people just saying what they think. To me, there's a, that's the great distinction. Um, I'm here to do, as you know, a program for Washington Week. 
And the thing that makes Washington Week different from all of the other programs you see where people are sitting around at a table and yapping at each other is that I make sure that the people yapping are reporters who actually have done, asked the questions, done the stories, talked to the people involved, and then brought in information and facts rather than opinion to what they're going to tell me. And that way, we are learning from each other. If you ever have a chance to watch us or if you come to the show tomorrow, you'll see we're kind of vibing off of each other because we want to know what the other person knows, not just what I've brought to that I know. Um, I've seen reporters jump up from our table on Friday nights and go off to file a story based on a tip they just got from another reporter sitting at the table, uh, something they didn't know. It's a very interesting and smart way, it seems to me, of keeping journalism alive if we, if we do it the right way. So that's, um, I'm optimistic about that. I'm optimistic about the way we get our information. I'm sometimes less optimistic about our willingness to do it. but. Um, we can do it. We can do it. We can figure it out. I'm on a board of a group called the News Literacy Project, which uh, we go into high schools and our jobs is to teach people how to answer, get the right answers to the questions they need and not just accept what comes over the transom. To me, that's where it starts and that's where it continues. So I'll stop at that. You know, I, we'd asked Ryan Lochte the right questions, we would have known the answer, but it wasn't a journalist asking the questions, for instance. That, that just leaps to mind. Anyway, I'll stop there, and I'm happy to take questions. Please ask them. Go crazy. Oh, the professor gets to ask the first question. That's I'm dying good. to know what you think about something. So as a highly regarded and well-respected journalist, I'm wondering if you'll comment on the other headline today about the starkly different treatment of mm -hmm. the two candidates last night by Matt Lauer. You have to tell me what you mean. Um, Matt Lauer, I, I, yeah, I wasn't sure if you would um, have time to have seen that, but uh, when he was interviewing uh, Clinton last night and then Trump, he he treated them very, very, very differently. I mean, it's the highest trending story in the New York Times right now. He he frequently cut uh, Secretary Clinton off and told her she didn't have enough time or she needed, you know, and he spent like a third of the time uh, talking about her emails. Yeah. And then... I did, um, no, I did see this. I just want to know how you interpreted it. Sure. Because I do think that a lot of this is open to interpretation. I, I watched the Clinton interview, and I have to say there's a couple things. One is, there's a couple things going on here. One is there is a, especially among pro-Hillary people, there is a certainty that she's being treated poorly because of her gender. Um, the other day, I think uh, Donald Trump said something like, uh, I mean, she's not even, she doesn't even look like a president. I'm right, fellas? And everybody went, what? And I, I interviewed Tim Kaine, her running mate, that night. He said, everybody knows what he meant by that, that it was cl clearly gender specific. So there's that. There's a lot of people who are certain that that's the case. Watching the um, Commander in Chief Forum on NBC last night, I was struck mostly, maybe because I'm a technical person on this, that it was only a half an hour for a very complicated subject. And I don't know how it was possible. And since Hillary Clinton's instinct is to give speeches, I think what he came in with, and I don't know, I wasn't part of it, but I think he came in with a try to try to get her off of her speech making. You'll notice he started by saying, please don't spend this time attacking your candidate. She still came around and found a way to do it. Um, I mean, your competitor. And so she was, he was trying to get her off her talking points. And by doing that, the only way you do that is to interrupt. Interruption never looks good. It's a real, it's a real judgment call on the part of the, of the, uh, of the, moderator. But frankly, I think the, the thing I've been seeing the most online today is not about how he treated her, but how Don, Donald Trump failed to answer the questions and how, how he was giving the same answers he was giving in the primary debates before when he was on a stage with 16 other people. I think people expected, especially now that he's getting intelligence briefings, that he ever have a little bit more to say. He corrected a military vet, veteran on the number on the statistic about the number of vets who committed suicide. Why do you why would you correct an actual PTSD survivor about something like that? He, he did so many things that were wrong and incorrect and kind of surprising considering the fact that he now has been doing this for a long. We'll just take the oil and it'll all be better. How do you take the oil of a sovereign nation? I mean, but there's not time in a half an hour debate to follow up on every single one of those things. So I don't necessarily care whether he was mean to Hillary Clinton. She's tough. She can take it. I care about the answers more than the questions. And to me, when it came to the answers, it was Donald Trump who did not rise to the level last night. Yes. Um, this is slightly related. Do you don't mind telling me where you're from and stuff like that? Oh, yeah. My name's Isaac. I'm a senior. Uh, grew up in Colorado. Okay. Um, and my question is, given your experience 
um, on the show and as moderator for various debates. To you, what when you hear the phrase civil dialogue, civil political dialogue, what does that mean? It's sort of been a theme of this some presidential symposium mm -hmm. we've been having here at school. And how how do you foster that instead of get two people to talk to each other instead <laughs> of just past each other? That's kind of my calling in life. Um, I think civil political dialogue means that you're actually listening to the answer. Um, my, my problem sometimes is that people come in with an answer. They don't want to hear your answer. They come up with an answer to the question. People ask me, for instance, all the time, how do you stand it when someone says something that's clearly not true to you? How do you stand it when someone says something to you that's kind of obnoxious? And I always say, uh, I, my, I'm always interested in hearing the answer. I, I don't really care so much if I agree with you. And because I want to hear the answer, the News Hour in Washington, we have a reputation for being places where we're listening. If you've decided what you think already, you stop listening. You just have. Um, if you come into a dialogue saying, I believe this, and therefore you are wrong, you can still hold on to your beliefs. But if you believe the other person is wrong just by definition, then you're already become, un then there's more likelihood that you're going to be uncivil. Civil, civility is just listening to one another. Uh, every Friday night in Washington, we, we have Shields and Brooks. Do David Brooks from the New York Times, who's Republican mostly, and, and, and Mark Shields, who's a columnist, who's Democratic mostly. And they have civil conversations and civil disagreements every single week. I think it's really possible. I think that we're actually more curious than we think we are. But we have to find ourselves in places, and I'm glad to hear that a conversation is happening on this campus, where we're likely to hear someone who disagrees with us, and then we'll listen to it. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who's got a, student, who's got a kid at um, NYU, and um, the, her, her daughter was saying that she was very unhappy, not unhappy, but she was a Hillary supporter on the campus of NYU, which was very pro-Bernie, and she didn't feel like she could ever speak up and let it be known that she supported Hillary because people would, not, would just jump all over her. She would have to go uptown to Columbia to find any Hillary supporters. I mean, they, this, these were, this is a college campus where you're supposed to be open for discussion, and, they had sh and people had shut it down. Um, I don't think that's healthy, and I think it's not healthy for the, for the future either. So that's, that's kind of my definition, which is you have to be willing to listen, even if it doesn't change your mind. Yes. Hi, I'm David. Um, I'm also a senior and also from Colorado. Um, I'm curious, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest stories right now is the simmering racial tension going on and in, um, in the rise of the Black Lives Matter protest group. Um, and come November, given that all, if you count Green Party and Libertarian Party, um, all four major party candidates are white, we're going to have a white president come November. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm curious what, how that's going to affect, um, particularly, particularly since our former, then former president is going to be black, how that's going to affect the debate over racial issues in America right now having a white person as our commander in chief instead of President Barack well, Obama. Well, you know, think about our history. We've had a white person for our entire <laughs> history up until then. And some of the biggest breakthroughs that have happened in terms of, of equality and laws and access have happened under white presidents, to be quite honest. You shouldn't have to have a black president in order to make progress. That said, I concede to you that this is a very tense time. In fact, I, I've come around to thinking that having an African-American president has actually made it harder to have that conversation. Because it's so easy for people who don't want to have the conversation to turn it into a debate about him rather than a debate about the issues at hand. It, to me, it doesn't matter if President Obama believes that Black Lives Matter movement is important or not. It, it, it matters more to me if the folks who live down the street from me or go to church with me think so. That's the debate that we have to have, and that's the discussion we have to have among ourselves, not just among our leaders, but down here. Um, so much of the tensions we have seen have all played out in the local. They haven't played out in front of on Capitol Hill or at the White House. They've played out in Dallas, and they've played out in Milwaukee, and they've played out in places where, by the way, it's been simmering for a very long time. So it's not a brand new idea, and I don't know that you need to have a black president in order to address it. I think you need to probably have African Americans in positions of power throughout. I mean, think about the police chief in Dallas and how he handled that and how he diffused the situation and how important it was to have a black man who was being able to make the points on one hand, on the other hand. He wasn't saying an absolute. And that's where we see, need to see more activity, I think, on a local level and in conversations at people's kitchen tables, honestly. I've covered more um, 
pronouncements about blue ribbon ki commissions and conversations about race that lead to very little. So I'd like to see that conversation actually take root further down than at the top. Symbolically, symbolically it was huge to have an African-American president. I'm not cer certain that moved the ball in the way that a lot of people thought it would on racial issues. I think he would tell you he didn't think it would. Yes. I'm Jared Russell, um, also from Colorado, with like 10 kids in I'm, I'm detecting <laughs> a, a theme. <laughs> it's not a theme, though. I don't think too many of us are from Colorado. Um, so the New York Times ran a story back in March that talked about how Donald Trump at that point, um, so as of, what, five months ago now, Donald Trump had received $2 billion in free media. So I was wondering, um, like, in this age of, like, the 24-hour news cycle when ratings are kind of the most important thing and there has to be constant coverage of um, one particular issue. Um, what's your take on something being provocative versus something being newsworthy and what's the distinction? And That's a good question. Um, ultimately, how does that promote candidates that are that typically run for office versus candidates that are saying outrageous things that are hmm. running for office? Um, I'm not sure that we can draw the distinction anymore. I hate to say it. We have fallen in love with bright, shiny objects that we chase down the street, and that's, and that's what we do. We spend 24 hours on one big story, and then if, you don't, if you're paying attention, you'll notice it goes away. But the cumulative, cumulative effect, and oddly enough, Donald Trump figured this out. He figured this out long before he ever got into politics, which is as long as you can catch the eye with a little bright, shiny object, even if it's negative for a day, even if he gets a negative, uh, we say, can't believe he said that for 24 hours, Still, his name was on the story. He managed to, he can stomp on a storyline, even his own storyline, with something more outrageous than he said the day before. It's, a, it's really a skill. I don't think it's a healthy a debate, way to have a debate in a free society. But I also think it's hard to um, expect commercial news outlets or commercial outlets in general to find a way to stop covering news just because the other guy is making it. If he's making it, we're going to say, there's never going to be a meeting in a conference room somewhere where they say, well, the president just said Hillary, I mean, Donald Trump just said Hillary Clinton should be shot. Let's not cover that. That's never going to happen. It's, even though it was outrageous, it was irresponsible, it's going to dominate the news, and he's finally going to say, I didn't say shot, I said wounded, you know. And the next day it's over and he finds something else to talk about. There's no way that in a newsroom they're going to look away from something like that. And he knows it. So he plays the outrage card. Uh, the outrageous card, I think, is even more a better way of putting it. Um, and what we have constant conversations about in our non-commercial newsroom is how do we have a way to explain to people what's important without ignoring what's um, the, the news of the day. So, so, for instance, our news hour morning meeting, we'll sit there and we'll say, so Donald Trump just said Hillary Clinton should be shot. What do we do with that? Well, we might have an expert to talk about shooting of, you know, assassination threats against previous presidential candidates, but not, probably not. We'll probably put it in, we'll probably take note of it, and then maybe we'll have a discussion about climate change, maybe, because that's, we made a decision this year, we want to be the ones to decide what the story is that people want to know, as much as what the politicians are driving it. So yeah, he's going to get, we're going to make sure you know everything that's going on. But it's very, very hard in the way the media world is structured, especially the commercial media world, to look away when something is remarkable that's happening. I don't know how you add up $2 million in free media, honestly. I really don't. Um, but I do know that people who, are, who say they are voting for one politician or another aren't having their minds changed by that. They've made up their minds. There's a very small pe group of people who haven't already made up their minds, and they're the ones we're going to see. We're going to see how the candidates figure out how to target between now and November. Yes. So um, I'm Rain. I'm from Colorado as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep going until I find some non-Colorado. I, I promise we're actually like the minority. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. But anyway, you kind of touched on this earlier. But you're the most outspoken, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> But this election cycle has kind of fueled a debate within journalism about how to treat Donald Trump because a lot of news organizations and journalists feel that he's a threat to democracy and therefore that they have a duty to kind of leave aside objective reporting and report from their hearts. And I was wondering what you think is the importance of objectivity in journalism and whether there are cases like this one where you know your own opinion about a candidate should trump that. <laughs> so sweet. I know, so he's ruined a good word. Um, well, I've always thought, this is pre-Trump, that there's no such thing as objectivity. There is such a thing as fairness. 
And there's, the distinction is this. Objectivity means what the false equivalence I was telling you about. I will not tell you whether this is true or false. I will not tell you whether this is outrageous or not. I will just tell you this is what was said. I don't think that does a great favor to anybody. And it also ignores the fact that we all bring our own, I wouldn't call it biases, but our own experiences to how we judge what's important. The most, the biggest bias happens in newsrooms are the stories we don't cover. If, you know, we're covering the refugees afloat in the Mediterranean, news organizations are covering, other news organizations are covering Donald Trump. There are important stories that are happening. Venezuela is falling apart. You know, people can't eat. There are amazing things happening in the world that aren't being covered. And to me, the bias is the non-coverage. Okay, that said, I think that with Donald Trump, the debate isn't speaking from the heart. The debate is saying, this, is, this isn't true or this is not. When someone says something that is just objectively not true, you've noticed, uh, for instance, CNN has started putting something on the bottom of the screen where they'll say, Donald Trump says this, says he, he, always, he was always against the Iraq war. Not true. I mean, they'll just, they'll just say it. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think when someone consistently says something that is not true, it's not a bad idea. It's, in fact, it's a responsibility to somehow weave into the conversation that that's not true. Um, on the, that said, when a candidate says 85 things in half an hour that are not true, you could spend another half an hour trying to get him to say, to, to, to admit to it, and that doesn't serve anybody's purpose except you get into a big argument. So you have to make a judgment call on live television, especially when you have a limited amount of time, on, in debates, as you'll see, when even you have a, a responsibility that they both have equal time, um, to make sure that you try to find a way, and that's the hardest part of this year, because one of the candidates is so clearly um, not, not respectful of true things. I'm trying to not use the L word. Um, <laughs> it, it makes it, a, it makes it, a, but it, it makes it hard, but it still makes it a responsibility for reporters and, and, and not so much pundits, because pundits can say whatever they want. It's their opinion. And frankly, we should always, always remember to make the distinction between people whose job it is to have an opinion and people whose job it is to try to tell the story fairly. But to me, we, it always comes back to fairness to the extent that you can do it and the limitations of the of the craft. Okay, a non coloradan Yes? Okay. Hi, I'm Gabby. I'm a senior and I'm from New Jersey. There we go. <laughs> um, so, I mean, clearly everyone's focusing throughout the media I and mean, our attention um, on this current upcoming presidential debate, uh, or not debate, sorry, presidential election, yeah. um, everything that we've clearly already mentioned with Donald Trump. I'm actually kind of <coughs> curious about the, the effect that this will all have on the midterm elections, which uh, you have your primaries in a lot of states that have just happened that have gone relatively uncovered and then mm -hmm. you have uh, kind of conversations about one side being kind of untrustworthy and corrupt. I never get questions about the midterms. This yeah. is so exciting. <laughs> and then on the other hand, you get one party that's become entirely racialized and almost exclusionary in a sense. So I don't know. I'm curious. What I think Republicans think. would tell you that the Democratic uh, Party is racialized. Oh, yeah. And, uh, when 99% of the of black people say they're not going to vote for Donald Trump, exactly. it's just a racialized party, you know? But you know what I mean. Like, yeah, the, I do. There's a huge racial component to yeah. that I think even more so than in the past. I think that in a, in a, in a, in a presidential election year, midterm elections just sink because of there's such a big top thing happening at the top of the ticket. And to the extent that we're curious about what's happening in a lot of, um, of, of local elections, it has to do with a kind of a Rorschach test. What's how does Donald Trump affecting the congressional third district? I mean, how is his if if you think it's racialization, how is that trickling down? How is the notion, for instance, how is the immigration debate, which is alive and um, on fire, how does that affect what happens in a local school board election? And the truth is, it, it has a lot to do with it. And if only because it sets the tone and the atmosphere for debates and, and policy discussions that otherwise would not happen. I don't think we're going to hear a lot about, you know, midterm elections this time, and partly because on the congressional level, people are so sick of Congress. They are so disheartened by Congress. They are so stunned that they can't pass Zika funding. They are stunned that the reason for it is because one is pointing the finger at the other, that I think that they are, would rather, if they have to pay the t attention to politics at all, which, by the way, a lot of people don't want to, they're going to pay attention to what's happening at the top of the ticket. There's definitely trickle down, though. Yes. Um, my name is Paul. I'm from Pennsylvania. Um, so coming from a swing state, a huge thing are the presidential debates. And like you said, you've, mod you've moderated, mm -hmm. too. Um, and I think 
something that's really important, especially for the upcoming debate, um, that I think a lot of people are, are looking forward to. Well, kind of. But, um, <laughs> yeah, we'll be watching. Like, I think most people are pretty tired of hearing the same questions, such as what about the emails and stuff like that. Is there oh something like that can come from the public, I guess, to kind of change those questions to actually make them important issues, like the climate change question, which will affect the immigration question, which will affect our mm -hmm. financial situation, which will affect basically almost everything in America and across the globe. Um, is there anything that like, <coughs> we can do to attempt to like kind of shift the conversation to actual important topics that need to be discussed? This is a good question. I have to, I can't tell you, I have no idea. I know all the debate moderators and I have some idea of how they're pre preparing, but I don't know what they are prepared to say. I, I can tell you this, every debate moderator tries to figure a way to get past the speeches to get past, to, to create, it's a rare opportunity to see a contrast between the two candidates on any issues. There's no question that they disagree on climate change, and this has not been an issue which has come up. I, I personally would like to hear them talk about it. I would like to hear the contrast between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump on climate change and find out how informed either of them is. We're down to the basic question at these debates is, how informed are you, not what would you do? And so the way that, I'll get, I'll get to your question about how you affect it in a minute, which I'm not sure you can, but I'll get back to it. I, my, my biggest experience with this was in the, my, the first debate I moderated was in 2004, and the, it was the vice presidential candidate, Dick Cheney, and John Edwards, who I always say, if I had a chance to do it again, the questions would be different for each of them. But when, at the time, I was trying to figure out, there's only one vice presidential debate, um, how do I get them to talk about something that's off their topic, something they haven't rehearsed for, something they wouldn't expect? And I came across a, a, a number, a, a statistic about African American, I mean, HIV infection among African American women, was skyrocketing at the time. Nobody was talking about this. And I prefaced my question by saying, you've all both talked about AIDS in Africa. I want to talk about AIDS in this country. Please don't talk about AIDS in Africa. What would you do? if you were in this administration about this issue about skyrocketing HIV infections among African American women. It was very specific. Dick Cheney's response was, oh, I didn't know that. End of response. John Edwards' response was, well, let me give you my three-point plan for AIDS in Africa. I found out afterwards from the people who prepped him for that debate that that was the question they thought I was going to get, give them. AIDS, an AIDS in Africa question. So he didn't even hear the distinction. He just, it just clicked in, just clicked in. And so at one point I had a choice. Neither of them answered the question. Knew, neither of them even knew about it. And I could have chased them around the table, but I kind of made a decision as a moderator that this, the viewers at home have done and learned what they needed to learn about this, which is that none of them knew or cared. And I, to this day, all these years later, still get people who walk up to me and say, love that AIDS question. People remember when these candidates reveal themselves for, for what they are, for what they don't know and what they do know. So I think that's part of the moderator's responsibility to let the viewers at home know what these guys are, or women in this capable, case are capable of. I don't know what the, for, for sure what the formats are, are, format is this year, but I knew, do know that at least in the, I think the town hall debate, they are making some effort to solicit questions on Facebook or from uh, it, for online. Um, those then get intensely vetted by the moderators. And because moderators like to be the ones to ask the questions, I suspect very few of them might make it through. But, the, but it gives the, as you notice in a lot of the primary debates, it gives the idea that somebody else is weighing in. When Judy Woodruff and I moderated a debate for the Democratic primaries, you know, we used a lot of questions that came from Facebook for that reason, because we wanted to get just outside of our voices. I don't know that, you know, if you do it that way that you'll get heard, but it's, it's better than it used to be when it was completely in the moderator's hands. Yes. Um, I'm Lily. I'm from Vermont. And I was just, media is such a well-oiled machine now, and it goes on sort of these really vicious 24-hour um, cycles. And watching the current presidential election is sort of like watching a freak show just, like, unfold before your eyes. How can we feel as American citizens like we have a voice um, because sometimes voting just feels like shouting into the void. That was dark. I'm that sorry. was dark. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wish I could tell you this is a brand new idea. I think uh, 10 years ago maybe, Howie Kurtz, who's now at Fox, wrote a book called Freak Show about the election that year. Um, I think people feel that way a lot, that they're not being heard. But I just don't know a better way of getting heard than to vote. Um, my, I worked once 
uh, for a newspaper where the editor believed that reporters shouldn't vote because it was biased. And I had to take him aside and say, well, that's very all well and good for you, nice white man. But <laughs> I, I believe there were people who were hosed for my right to vote. So it would be, to me, insulting not to take advantage of that. Now, sometimes it feels like I live in the District of Columbia, which doesn't even you know, have a vote in Congress. So it feels like sometimes I'm just throwing things out there when I go to vote because it's not where is it going to get heard. But I still feel like I have to. I feel like it's my responsibility that if I don't get heard any other way, at least I've done the basics. And then after that, that's the baseline. And then after that, you do what comes next. Um, I can't tell you how to get heard. I just know that that's the baseline. And a whole lot of countries, people don't even have that baseline. Yes. Hi, my name's Sachin. Um, I'm a senior, and I'm also from Colorado. Uh, That's all right. We had a couple Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thought, it, thought we'd make a return. <laughs> um, my question is somewhat related to Gabby's, and sort of like as per what you had to say about breakthroughs, I kind of wanted to ask you about um, the immediate effect of the Obama presidency for candidates of color. Um, do you think now it's sort of harder or easier for candidates of color to break through? Um, as we've seen with this race, we have four all white candidates, so I'm, I think mean, there's been some discussion about us kind of going the other way. And um, do you think the American electorate is more comfortable with candidates of colors, candidates of color, especially in like these larger races such as the presidency? I am an optimist when it comes to these things. I don't necessarily. I would have never expected that after the first black slash woman slash Asian slash whatever president, that the very next one would be that. I think America felt, felt very proud of itself for having shocked itself in 2008, and that was going to have to take a while to get used to the idea and go back to where it was. But keep in mind, you know, Hillary Clinton is still going to be a history-making breakthrough if she is elected. And in his own way, <laughs> white male that he is, Donald Trump would be a history-making breakthrough as well. Um, so I don't, I, I do think that Americans in general, even though this election seems to have unearthed a lot of unsavory discussion about the way we see each other. I also think that we're having the discussions in ways that we never did before. I think we are, as a people, more comfortable with the notion of our diversity. And plus, guess what? It's not going backwards, it's going forward. This is a diverse country, and you can't legislate that away. You can't deport that away. You, ca you can't. Uh, and so as a result, I think that most people who live normal, everyday lives and aren't on podiums debating things, um, get that. They interact in that way. Uh, now, w it's also true that a whole lot of people do not interact in any way with people who are different than they are. But it doesn't mean they're automatically hostile. So I, I just, I, I'm kind of more optimistic. I'm optimistic that a whole generation of young people looked up and saw automatically that there was a black president and it didn't seem unusual to them. It didn't even, I mean, it's still shocking to people my age because we lived through so many years where we never saw anything else. But I think it's now become just a matter of fact issue for a lot of younger people. And that to me is where change happens. And that's where growth happens. Thank goodness it doesn't depend on people in my age group to make the change happen. It depends on people who have now come of age at a time when this seems perfectly normal to see a person of color on their local ballot or their national ballot. And they can make the decision about whether to vote for them based on what they believe rather than what they, uh, what they think their skin color is or their affinity is. And that, that's healthy. So I think having any kind of breakthrough always moves us forward, if not by leaps and bounds over mountains. Yes. Um, so I'm Camila, and I'm from Uruguay. Sorry. That's good bar. That's good bar. <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes, like, I, it's the first time for me in the U.S. I just came, like, a few weeks ago. Oh. And being in this intense class, I, one thing that really surprised me is, like, how the government is so influenced by media to actually, like, make some issues priority in the agenda. Um, but, like, these issues that don't change, in fact, uh, and they are aware of that. Like the government is aware that it's it, it's not a matter of changing fact, but like a matter of changing image. Give me an example of an is of an issue like that. Like climate change. Okay. Or for example, I know gamer. So okay. it it has become like more of a human image rather than like religious image. And that the the fact didn't change. It's only like the image that the media gave. And only when it was like something very like you know covered by media, uh, like government actually did something about it. So I'm aware that this is because of a partisan divide. Um, but why is it that this divide kind of works in an obst obst obstructive way rather than a constructive way um, until mm -hmm. the media steps in? 
I, I actually, I'm not as uh, d pessimistic as you are about that. I, I think that, for, let's start with gay marriage. It wasn't just the media that drove that. It was the country that drove that. It was Will and Grace, which you might not know about, but it was a sitcom about a gay man and his best straight friend. It was the normalizing of the idea of gayness in our lives, that the person next door would be gay, or why wouldn't they be married? I, you know, I, I, I'm married and they're married and they keep their lawn up and I keep my lawn up. I think it became the normalizing of the idea that made it change, in, that made the government catch up. I think America, Americans led the charge and then government caught up. And then the Supreme Court caught up because Americans had actually basically done this. So I don't, and I think the media caught up late too. Sometimes we're chasing after the story when the story is way ahead of us. So I think that's what happened with gay marriage and with gay rights in general. I think that we were slow to it in the media and I think government also followed the lead set by individuals, which I think is exactly what democracy is. Climate change is a little bit more difficult because we are arguing fact here. There are facts, there are scientists who say this is true and there are people, politicians mostly, who say, well, it depends who you listen to. They actually make it seem like it's a subjective idea. Um, I don't know how you do that, how we fight through that. I think in the end, um, we, mo we make slow progress. We sign a climate change agreement in China, as the president did last week. We sign climate change agreements in Kyoto, which sometimes stay and sometimes don't. But it doesn't mean like progress is halted just because there's a debate happening. Have, it, have the debate, but then scientists keep pushing. They keep sending out the pictures of glaciers melting. They, seem, they, they keep making the uh, amazing photographs and showing the facts of it. It doesn't mean that everyone's gonna agree instantly for whatever reasons. But that's also democracy, that we debate it until we get to the point where everybody agrees. Hi. Hello, my name is Tarek, I'm from California. Um, given, where do we start? Um, people are understandably scared of Trump and what he might do if he's elected, but given his- Everybody's not scared. Not, no, not everybody. Okay, <laughs> or he it's wouldn't be doing as well as yeah. he's doing. Right, um, but given his political background as a Democrat, do you believe this could influence his future if he, suppose, if he does end up becoming president? I have no idea. You know, I don't think he was ever a Democrat because he had a set of policies that he believed in. He was a Democrat because he lived in New York and that was the way to get business done. And I think he'd say that. So I don't, anybody who thinks, oh, well, he'll get elected and then he'll be a Democrat again, should not think that. They should think that he is going to do what, it needs, what he needs to do to get business done. That part he has been very consistent about. Um, the, in, the interesting thing about this, as Republicans are discovering, is this is not an election about partisanship so much. Um, they, the Republicans, are, their hair is on fire as much as Democrats' hair are, are, are on fire about Donald Trump because he is not at all adhering in many respects to their, their, belief, their sets of beliefs. Um, there are Republicans who have just given up on this election or are trying to figure out what's going to happen in the next one four years from now. Um, but I don't think that, I think we should accept the candidates for what they present themselves to be. And whether you like that or you don't like that, uh, it's not about the partisanship necessarily. Yes. Hi, my name is Izzy. I'm from Colorado. <laughs> Sorry. It's just this robot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was wondering, I think uh, millennials are very disillusioned with talking constantly about candidates and parties um, and the feuds between them. And I was just wondering what, if we could focus instead on talking about issues and how those matter for our generation, um, what the issues you're most excited or most interested in talking about this election season and I love the way you speak for all millennials. That's good. Um, I'll speak for all old people. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, the whole thing about what millennials believe is another discussion about that we could have. But, I, you know, I have oft, all, always believed that we should be talking about issues instead of about personalities. I almost, if you go on, on my, if I go on my Twitter feed and I post a story that we did about the shootings in Chicago, or I post a story that we did about the amazing um, destruction of art in Syria, or the stories that we've done about any number of issues. It's the 15th year anniversary of 9-11. We've talked about how America has changed in terms of its internal security and its views about terrorism. They'll get a lot less clicks than the stories about what Donald Trump said last night. So this idea that people really want to talk about the issues, 
is not supported on social media at least where, where millennials live. So I, I would love to talk about the issues. I would love to talk about the economy. I'm leaving here now to do a story about that very same thing, about the issues of concern in this military community. But I don't necessarily think there are, there are really smart people who want to talk about them, but I don't think it's the majority of people who are engaged in the political debate at least not on social media, where we all seem to live these days. So if you have an idea about how we can make people talk about real issues and not to talk about uh, Donald Trump tripping off a curb, let me know. Yeah. During your career, who has been the hardest? You're from Colorado. You already had a question. Wait a second. I want to get one more. Perfect. Now, I'm going to come back to you, but I want to get, get one. Somebody else had a hand up. No, you go. Oh, okay. All right. You first. During your entire career, who has been the hardest person to interview? Um, I find every day I have a hard person to interview because my idea of a good interview is someone who answers the question. And um, I find that politicians in particular are difficult because they come with a story they want to tell you and you can't, whatever you do, as we saw Matt Lauer trying to do last night, you can't get them off of it. Um, my most embarrassing interview was attempting to ask a question of Nelson Mandela once when Hillary Clinton was first lady and she traveled to Africa and some of us went along, reporters, and then they told us at the last minute we were going to have uh, a chance to ask a question of President, at then, I think by then he was no longer President Mandela, and I was so overwhelmed by the emotion of this idea, I decided no matter what happens, I'm asking him a question. Well, he came out and without any preamble said, questions please. So, uh, Mr. President, um, um, so what did you talk about in your meeting with, with the First Lady? He says, I believe we have addressed that. Bam! He knocked me down. I was like, <gasps> I, look so, I look so bad that the First Lady's press secretary looked at me with pity. It was like, it was one of, but you know what? I got to ask him a question. I did not get an answer, and it was embarrassing, but I can now go to my grave saying I asked Nelson Mandela a question. Those, those kind of moments, those kind of risks you take, even if it's not uh, exactly what, you, what you've hoped for. I mean, I think the hardest thing I've ever done is moderate those debates. Um, there's some, there, not only are you trying to keep the time right, because someone's in your ear saying you've given 60 seconds extra to one guy rather than the other one. Um, you're also trying to keep track of what they're saying. When Sarah Palin walked out on the stage and shook Joe Biden's hand, I famously did not hear her say, can I call you Joe? I was sitting five feet from them, but because I, was, I had headphones on and I was thinking of my first question and the audience was applauding, I never heard it. But everybody at home heard it loud and clear because it went right into the microphone. Things like that are very, I mean, I don't know what I would have done if I had heard it, but it, I realized it set the tone for the entire debate and one of the few things that anyone remembers about it. Well, not one of the few things, a couple things. But, it was, but things like that are really, really hard to do, and they're harder than people give you credit for. But, uh, you know, but it's not my job to make it easy. It's my job to try to make sure that I got something out of it, and even if it's something that informed people by a non-answer. I'll come back to you, sir. Uh, I'm Gabe, and I, unfortunately, am also from Colorado. <laughs> I just don't believe you guys when you say these people are not. Go ahead. I think that that's, we've hit everyone. Uh, no one else is, but I don't know. Um, so I'm in a constitutional law class right now, um, and I think a lot of us are wondering, or have been wondering throughout the kind of media coverage of this election, why there was a brief hysteria after Scalia's death and Obama's attempted nomination about over Justice Garland that sort of has fallen to the wayside, and I haven't heard a single thing about it, which is kind of interesting, judging by the fact that he was sort of centrist, and if Clinton won, there's a chance that she could nominate someone much more liberal. And I don't know what, what if you could just speak to, you know, maybe why that has happened, and also maybe sure. the implications of just the Supreme Court vacancy. In it happened time. because the Republicans who were in charge of the Senate declared there would not be a hearing. Once there wasn't going to be a hearing, there was nothing much to debate. The reason they declared there wasn't be a hearing, they were pretty clear about this, was because they didn't, they didn't want to do anything during the presidential election season that would distract or create drama. Now, there was much discussion in the consternation about why they would not take the risk in case Hillary Clinton were elected of a more liberal justice, or if at the time it seemed that maybe they lost control of the Senate, um, that, that the Democrats would be able to confirm a more liberal justice. It was a risk that, um, that, that they took. I have heard that, to the extent that I've heard any more discussion, someone saw Judge Garland walking down the street in Washington the other day unmolested, just, you know, like, who are you? Oh, yeah, you're the guy who's... And, and I think that the, there's, there's been some talk about taking up a nomination during the lame duck Congress, that's to say after the election and before the inauguration. Um, I think it depends entirely on the outcome of the election on November 8th. 
Um, if Republicans were to find that, that Hillary Clinton were elected, they might realize that Judge Garland was the best they were going to get for a while. But it also depends whether they hold the Senate or not. So we're kind of in holding space on that nomination. Yes. Hi, I'm Davis, and I'm also from Colorado. Uh, <laughs> Liars. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> um, anyways, in a lot of people's eyes, Trump has risen to popularity through using emotion and preying upon people's emotions versus the typical politician who uses the centralized persuasion and policy making. Um, this is very concerning for me because, in my eyes, it sets the tone for future elections for other people like Trump to prey upon people's fear. And it's kind of opened the door for other politicians to do the same. In your eyes, is that something that concerns you for future elections, or do you think this is kind of a one and done type deal? I don't know, because I have to say I didn't even see this coming. So to say that I know or suspect or worry about what will happen in four years, I think the one thing we do is we always fight the last war. We say, oh, this happened last time, so will it happen next time? No idea. Something brand new, maybe even more concerning, could happen next time. And it completely depends on the outcome. If Donald Trump is is trounced at the polls, people will say, well, that was a fever dream, and it'll be over, and people won't see it as a sign of something to, to, to win. If he wins, then it's going to change everything about the way we look at Washington, politics, the Senate, the House, um, who gets elected president. It's going to change a lot. So I think we kind of have to wait to see the outcome. I hate, hate to say it's not something that you can say, if you elect Trump, the world ends. I also think that if Hillary Clinton's elected, the, the biggest interesting thing that's going to happen is she, it, she doesn't get elected and her critics go away. Uh, she doesn't get elected and all of a sudden everyone decides they like her. A lot of people don't. And so the debates begin all over again with her as president. And that's something that everybody should brace for. No matter what happens, the next four years is going to be fasten your seatbelts. Yes? So, um, Wait a second. I already got one. I know. Other and I said she only got one. She, I tell her to come back to her. No, never mind. I'm, I'm keeping track of my head. Uh, it's very short. It's actually related to the millennium question when you said, like, how do you get you know, people to talk about real issues? So I come from a country that's very, like, in terms of youth, like, everyone talks about politics. Like, they will ask you, like, oh, oh. what's your name? Uh, what you, like, what's your age? Oh, which party do you support? Huh. Which is really, you know, it's, it's cool. Uh, but we achieve that by having like a mandatory uh, vote, vote oh. system. And like that gets people to, like, you know, when they're 16, they know like two years from now they, they will have to vote. So they, they get very concerned because it's like <coughs> it's a, an election that we all do. Mainly because we're only 3 million people. So, so, what's, so what's your question? <laughs> yeah, my question, no, my, my question was like, why is it not mandatory here? Uh. I can't imagine it. <laughs> a mandatory vote for, for president sounds great, but I can't think of anything else that's mandatory. Selective service isn't really mandatory in the way it was. You have to register, but you don't have to be, but there's no draft. Um, I, I've never even heard a discussion about the idea of making voting mandatory. And I think that this is not a society which likes to be told what you should do. Um, but who knows? I, I can't say, I don't know everything, but I don't think I've heard it. And I'm not sure how well it would go over. Who was I saying? Yeah. So um, I just wanted to say, like, you're such an inspiration, you know, as a woman and what you do. Oh. And, you know, as like, a trailblazer. <laughs> no, I need to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> you know, like, and you've been, like, a really big trailblazer for women in journalism and, you know, women in politics. So I was wondering, what's been the biggest struggle, you know, being a woman in kind of an old boys network? And what would be your advice to women in kind of getting in that, in that field? <laughs> Uh, usually, no. <laughs> usually the way that question is asked is, which is more difficult, being black or being a woman? And I have to say, that's actually more to the point for me. Because I have probably had more instances where people made up their minds about me or made conclusions about me, about my race, as about my gender. Um, to me, I can't separate it out. So since I was born a woman, I was born black, it, it, it's kind of, you can't separate it out. But along the way, I've had incidents. I got my very first job in a newspaper because someone left a racial slur for me at my workspace, which I won't repeat in this lovely, lovely college. OK, they called me a nigger. At, a, at, a, at, at my workspace, at my first job when I was interning. And as horrifying as it was, I have to say my first reaction was, I wonder who this is for. Is this for me? And then I realized it was. But the, my bosses were so horrified that they offered me a job if I ever wanted one. Now, I had, had no intention of going back to work for these racists, right, until I couldn't get a job. At which point, <laughs> I went back and said, did you say you had a job? And it got me into the business. And so as horrifying as it was, I didn't spend a lot of time 
you know, weeping over the terrible insult, I was able to use it to my advantage. Um, I think the thing about being a woman is that you have to decide what are the fights worth, like life, what are the fights worth fighting? I, I find that people always want women to smile. You know, why, why aren't you smiling? Why do you look mad? And I'm like, I'm not mad, I'm just thinking. And th which is why last night, I don't know if you noticed that the, the head of the Republican Party put out a tweet saying Hillary Clinton failed because she didn't smile. She was happy about that. She immediately responded by saying, really? Because that's how you behave when you're commander in chief, you know. And, but, it, but every woman recognizes that. It's like, a, it's like a dog whistle when someone tells you, when construction workers say, hey, baby, smile. You're like, really? Oh. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of behavior about how, I also learned that sometimes it's just easier to smile and get it over with. Um, you decide over time what are the fights worth fighting, whether it matters that you are, um, whether what's happening to you is happening because of your gender or your race or neither, or because maybe you were wrong, and you try to separate it out. Um, and as a result, I, I think I, I hit a pretty sweet spot where you, in the end you learn how to talk to people, how to engage in people. You learn how to not spend a whole lot of time thinking it's about you, but trying to move forward to the facts. And people will take your dog on seriously if they know that they will be held accountable for what you say and what you write. So I, I used to lo love a little, I used to have a little game when I worked in newspapers and people would talk to me on the phone and they knew I was a woman, but they didn't know anything else about me. And I, I could speak in a certain way that you can't really tell. And I walked, they, I'd walk in to meet them and there would be this moment of silence. And then they'd realize, but this is the woman from the New York Times. Okay, I guess I'll talk to you. I mean, it would take them a minute, but then the power relationship actually won in the end. And so I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it anymore, honestly. Um, I'm conscious of it, obviously, and I like being everything that I am. But I don't, I don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, Lord, I'm black again. You know, I, <laughs> it's, kind of, it's, kind of what, it's kind of the deal, and I kind of like it. So as a result, you find a way to incorporate everything that you are into what makes you valuable to the people around you and the people in your life. Thank you so much. For I know. Someone's really giving me this stare. Thank you so much, everybody. This is really fun. Thanks.